Well, to the South Campus, to Converge, to the West Campus, and certainly the Fort Worth Campus as well, good morning, good morning. A few of you, thank you, God bless you. You obviously have the gift of mercy. If you clap to that in any way, that shows you why I was not in Singing in the Rain, the musical, but I hope you were able to see it. Those tunes are stuck in my head, so if any of those lyrics start showing back up through the sermon, uh, you'll you'll understand why. I thought it was fantastic. I certainly hope you're able to come. Uh, If you weren't, they literally made it rain in the sanctuary, and so I told somebody earlier, uh, two years ago at Christmas, we made it snow, then we made it rain, I'm bringing fire, okay? I am bringing the pyrotechnics, I wanna see fire, so we're gonna continue to uh, push the limits of our creativity, all for the glory of God. uh, We get to have a lot of fun here, and I'm so grateful that you're a part of it. Uh, I want to ask you a question this morning. I'm not a betting man, but I do like to make silly wagers, and so uh, let's make a little silly wager here this morning. Uh, Let's pretend that you went down to a local track and you were going to watch a race, and the race was between uh, one person who was in like one of those potato sacks, you know, a sack race, and then another, in the other lane, there were two people and they were bound together, they were gonna run the race as a a three-legged pair. Now, who would you bet on? Now, some of you, you're like, what what is a three-legged, what is a sack race? You were deprived of your childhood, okay? Now, I'll go ahead, I will let you cheat, okay? I'm gonna show you examples of what these look like. First, I'll show you what a three-legged race looks like. You, you wouldn't really hop. That's probably not the most efficient way, but you can see that a couple of those pairs are running pretty fast. This was, this was shot last week, I think. <laughs> uh, obviously, a li- little bit old school here. So that's like the, the three-legged race. You, you get an idea of what that looks like. You know, Poor gal is falling down. Okay, now what, is a, what does a sack race look like? You know, one of those, those big potato sacks. If you can see, you got kids falling and, and everything like that, kind of hopping as fast as they can. Now, if you saw that at the local track, who would you bet on? Would you bet on the person in the sack or would you bet on the three-legged pair? That wasn't rhetorical, come on. You'd bet on the three-legged pair, of course. I mean, they, 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 they were, would, would be so much faster. They, they even look like they have so much more freedom. The one who's in the sack look, looks like they're, they're so restricted. I mean, they, they can barely move their feet. They're, they're only hopping. But man, if that pair gets into a rhythm, I mean, they're going to they're gonna kill that person in the, in the sack. So if you would bet on the three-legged pair, then why every day do we bet on ourselves in the sack race? You see, this is an analogy for the spiritual life because too often in our spiritual life, rather than running the race as a three-legged pair with the person that God has bound us to, that person being the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, instead we say, we don't want to be bound to you We don't want to walk this walk with you. We don't want to live our Christian life with you. We don't want to run this race with you. Instead, we want to go our own way. And when we go our own way, we get in that sack and we get tripped up by our sin. And we try to move forward as fast as we can, but we don't have much direction and we certainly don't get anywhere fast, anywhere far. All too often in our Christian life, we don't run the race with the person that God has provided for us that can empower us to go further and faster. And so what I wanna do today is I want to stop us from getting tripped up, from falling on our faces, from going back into that sin that we always go back into that trip us up and leave us stranded and stuck. For some of you, This is gonna be the most important message you've ever heard about your Christian life. And it's not because of what I'm gonna say. 
It's because of what the word of God says. So if you would open your Bibles to Galatians chapter five, verses 16 to 26. Galatians chapter five, verses 16 to 26. If you're opening one of the blue Bibles, no matter what venue you're in, it's page 975. Hello to those of you who are streaming around the world as well. Thank you for joining with the Christ Chapel family. We certainly see you as a part of the family as well. We're gonna continue our series, Bound to be Free. This is our second to last message. We're almost done with this series as we've just walked through the book of Galatians. And the whole idea of Galatians is you've been set free. And I wanna go through some of those ways just so that, that you know what the aim is. Remember, Ben preached on Galatians chapter five, verse one last week. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. That, that's the point. That's why Jesus came was to set you free, to set you free spiritually so that you were no longer enslaved to sin and death, to, to set you free emotionally so that you no longer live in fear of, God, do I have to please you? God, have I done enough? Because Jesus has already done enough for us. He's, he's come to set you free socially so that you don't have to live up to anybody else's standards. You don't have to climb a ladder like the church is a country club because that's not what we are. And he sets you free practically, telling you that if it's not sin, go for it. The, the Christian life isn't this razor blade that you have to walk down. He says, I mean, you're free. If it's not sin, go for it. You, you've been set free in Christ in all of these different ways. And he sets you free to run this race with the Holy Spirit. And I know that becomes a touchy subject sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, but I hope I'm gonna do a good job to explain it. Fingers crossed. But he sets us free in that way so that we can run in the freedom. He wants us to move forward in our Christian life. That's why he's given us the Holy Spirit. But he says this, look, look back at verse seven. I just wanna cover that real fast. Galatians five, verse seven. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You see, when you, when you started off in the Christian life, when you first came to know Christ, you enjoyed great freedom. You were bound to the Holy Spirit. You, you were in that three-legged race, like there was a, a rope or a cloth or whatever that was tied around, and you were in sync. You were moving with them. You were enjoying the Christian life, but somebody came in, and they, they duped you, and you thought, you know what? The Christian life, I don't really want to be bound by the Spirit. I don't really want to keep in step with the Spirit. Now I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go my own way. And you got it in that sack and you started trying to hop your own way and you fall. You fall into temptation, you fall into sin, you're stuck. And he says, who, who, who hindered you? Who, who duped you? Who came in and stole your freedom for you? Who convinced you to give that up so that you go your own way? Because if you've got to keep walking bound to the spirit so you can continue to experience freedom in your Christian life. I think if we were all honest, for those of you who have placed your trust in Jesus Christ and begun a relationship with God through his son, that some of your fondest memories of walking with Christ were right at the beginning. And you're like, man, that walk was awesome. Like, oh gosh, it just felt like everything was clicking. But then somehow, as we get older and we uh, go our own way, we end up drifting away from God. We end up drifting away from what his son has done for us. We end up drifting away from the Holy Spirit. And we don't keep in step with the Spirit anymore. We don't walk with him. And so it's no wonder that we don't enjoy the freedom that we once knew, that we once experienced. You see, you were walking, that's what Galatians 5, 7 said, you were walking, but then who hindered you? No wonder you're not experiencing freedom or joy any longer. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, I know I'm starting at the end of the line when it comes to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Before you came to know Christ, 
Uh, we are told that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, John 16, 8, says this role of the Spirit was to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So you were feeling conviction from the Holy Spirit. And then when you came to know Christ, you were indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit, you were filled with the Holy Spirit, and now your relationship to the Spirit is don't quench, don't grieve. Now you are supposed to walk within the Spirit or walk in the Spirit, walk with the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. I just gave you pneumatology 101 in about 30 seconds right there. Okay, so anyway, all that to say, you, the, the Holy Spirit has been interacting in your life and you have, have experienced the Holy Spirit if you've come to know Christ for a long time. This is at the end of the line. This is the everyday, Monday morning, practical relationship that you have with God, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. You've got to keep walking in the Spirit if you want to experience freedom in Christ. That's what he says. That's what he's talking about. Look at verses 16 through 18. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under the law. Now, I, I want you to go back to uh, right there at the beginning, and I want you to circle that word by, but I say walk by, circle, circle by. I want you to walk by the Holy Spirit. Because when you see that word by, it means two things. It means I want you to walk by the empowerment, with the empowerment of the Spirit, but also by meaning alongside, just like that three-legged race, walk next to, so that you can keep in step with the Spirit. When he talks about walking in the Spirit, he's talking about walking in the presence and in the power of the Holy Spirit, always in the presence and in the power. That's what he means there. And he says, if you walk in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh because those are contra, those are counter, those are against one another. If you're walking in the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, I've got to cover this because this is a super important point, okay? When it says the word desires here, the actual word in Greek is epithumia, epithumia, epi meaning over, and what he's saying here is the, the actual translation of this is over desires. He says, if you, if you walk in the spirit, you will not gratify the over desires of the flesh. Now, why do I say that? Because this is an important point. Because God created you as a human being with desires. And the goal of the Christian life is not to kill all of your desires. It's not for you to desire nothing. God has means, boundaries, and context for you to fulfill the desires for which he created you with. He knows you have them. But where we get in trouble is when we over-desire those things or we go outside the means by which he's set or outside the context that he's provided for us to fulfill the desires. We overreach, we over desire, and that's when we get in trouble. That's when he says you begin to gratify the desires of the flesh. That's where you're gonna get in trouble. So I just wanna clear that up because so often people are like, gosh, maybe I just shouldn't desire, you know, I just have to stop desiring that. No, he understands the desires you have. If it's an over desire, then, then that's where you're gonna find trouble and that's where it's gonna come in conflict with the spirit. Now, I, I've given you a, a chart that illustrates these two natures and all it does is break down verses 16 to 18 and I wanna show it to you. It's on your sermon notes, but it'll come up here on the screen because I wanna show you the difference of walking by the spirit, which is that three-legged race, or walking or following the flesh, which is trying to walk the Christian life in the sac race, all, all by yourself. See, walking by the Spirit gives you direction toward things that last. The Spirit is eternal and transcendent. 
And if you're keeping in step with the Spirit, then you're going to be walking toward things that last forever. But if you walk following the flesh, then you get stuck in things that won't last. You get stuck in trying to fulfill your overreaching desires here on this earth for temporal things that will never, ever last. Or walking by the Spirit aligns with the desires of God. Obviously, you're walking with the third person of the Trinity. But following the flesh contradicts the desires of God. It's in direct opposition to what God wants for your life. And walking by the Spirit provides power to free you from bondage. But following the flesh leads you to bondage. And this is why I said this might be the most important message you ever hear about the Christian life. Not because of anything that I say, but because some of you are stuck in sin and you don't know how to get out. And you say, okay, I just need to don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And you know what? Have you, the more you try to focus on not doing something, guess what you focus on? That thing. <laughs> you focus on the thing you don't wanna do. And the more you focus on that thing you don't wanna do, it becomes more and more of a temptation to do, or to believe, or to say, or to act on. And he's saying, listen, just walk with the Spirit. It becomes a focus. It's not don't do, it's do this. Walk in the Spirit. That's gonna set you free. That's gonna give you the, the power to be set free from that sin because you're walking in the power and in the presence. You're walking by the Holy Spirit. That's what he's, that's what he's saying in this passage. And it's gonna, it's gonna free a lot of you, which I'm super excited about. So how do you know if you're walking in the Spirit? You know you're walking by the Spirit when you are yielding to the Holy Spirit's guidance and power. When you are yielding to the Holy Spirit's guidance and power, then you know you're walking in the Spirit. Now, you know what the word yield means. You see it on the road all the time. Yield means to give way. You're allowing someone to go first, that's what he's saying here. If you're allowing the Spirit to lead you to, to go first and you're gonna follow along in this three-legged race, then you'll experience that power and presence of God. You know you're keeping in step with the Spirit when you're yielding to his guidance. But as I thought more and more about this analogy uh, of the three-legged race, which as you can tell, I'm gonna be using it through the whole sermon, so I hope it makes sense. I thought, you know, sometimes in my own Christian life, unfortunately, it doesn't look like I'm in a three-legged race, but my Christian walk looks more like this, <laughs> where the Spirit is trying to take me someplace, and I'm like, no! Hey, that little kid, I think he's going to the dentist or something, being taken to the dentist. And, and I'm resisting, and I don't want to go. And he's like, but this is the good place to go. This is the good place for you. I'm trying to take you. But let me tell you something, Christian. Your Christian walk is not passive. The Spirit is not going to drag you anywhere. You, you have two natures in you. You have a new nature given to you by the Holy Spirit, by Christ. You've been made alive with him. And you have this old nature that want, doesn't want to go. <laughs> and when you yield, when you say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield to you and allow you to guide me, then you know you're walking in the spirit, not resisting where he wants to take you. So in order to yield to the spirit's guidance and power, you need to pray, not my will, but thy will, then he obey his will. Pray, not my will, but thy will, God. I wanna yield to you, I want to go where you want me to go, but then you actually have to follow through and obey. You know, I've talked to people before, and they're like, man, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I'm like, great, did you obey? Huh? You know, there, there's, a, there's a cooperation here as we, as we talk about the Spirit, a, a yielding aspect. The Spirit is powerful, absolutely. But remember, your, your old nature is, is, is in opposition to what God is trying to do. Constantly, constantly. Guys, <laughs> I'm, not a, I, I'm not on Twitter, but everybody always says, hashtag the struggle is real. Man, in the spiritual life, hashtag struggle is real. I mean, it is. 
Go, go back, if you look at it again, remember, it, it, they're in opposition with one another. This reminds me, and you can write down if you wanna go study it later, Romans 7, where Paul's talking about the good that I wanna do, I don't do. I, wh- why is this? It's because those two things are in conflict, and so that's why we have to yield to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, not my will, I'll overreach, I'll overdesire, but your will, because you have a context, means, and bounds for which you want me to fulfill those desires, but you will lead me in that, and I'll follow you. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit. And then Paul goes on to give us some different examples of what gratifying the flesh means, because, and it's dangerous, because when we gratify the desires of the flesh, and remember, desires is over-desiring, overreaching, outside the context and bounds, when we gratify the desires of the flesh, then you're gonna walk alone and it's going to steal your life. You're walking alone and it's going to steal your life. And he goes in and he begins to give us examples of what this looks like. And remember, it's that idea that I'm not going to be bound by the Spirit, but I wanna walk alone. I wanna go over here and go my own direction, my own way, with my own power and my own strength, and it doesn't get you anywhere but stuck. That's what he talks about in 19 to 21. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, or another word for that is obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, good coming up on college football season that we mentioned that one, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is all evidence that you have decided to not walk by the Spirit, but instead walk alone by yourself, and you're walking to gratify those desires of the flesh. Now, some of you tuned out as soon as I said the first one, which was sexual immorality, and you're like, oh, not me. This list does not apply. But look at the, look at the spectrum on which this spans. The spectrum is huge. It starts with sexual immorality, which, by the way, it's the Greek word pornea, where we get our word pornography from, it's, it's fulfilling sexual desires outside the context of marriage. That's what that, mean, that's what that word means. So you, you might be guilty when you didn't even know it. Okay, so it goes all the way from pornea. It goes, I'm not gonna go through all the lists and tell you what everything means because I don't wanna take time to do that because um, this is just bad stuff. The works are evident, they're obvious. But another one that I just wanna point out to you which is interesting to me, is sorcery. All of you are like, sorcery? What is this, Harry Potter? Like, no way. You know, that's not me. Well, actually, the word sorcery here comes from the word, it's the Greek word where we get our word pharmacy. And what they used to do in sorcery was they would take drugs to get themselves worked up into trances to do incantations and all those kind of things. So actually, this word for sorcery means addiction. Addiction to drugs. I mean, and that's a real thing in our world. What, what has the power to overcome that? Only the spirit. And if you're like, not sexually immoral, not addicted to drugs, okay, are you angry? Is there any division in your life? Any jealousy? Any of those things? If there are, That's the time when you've chosen to not be bound to the spirit which is leading you to freedom, but instead said, I'm gonna go my own way. I don't like that person. I don't wanna talk to that person. I'm angry at that person. And you're overreaching. (laughs) Instead of coming back and going, spirit, where do you want to lead me? Where do you want to guide me? And he says, those who are fulfilling and trying to fulfill those overreaching desires outside his context and means, he says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, some of you might be scared to death when you go, what does that mean? So if I get angry, like I lose my salvation? No. What this is saying is those who continually 
practice this. Those who habitually practice fulfilling the desires of the flesh, gratifying the desires of the flesh, which means you have no evidence of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you have no evidence of that power and presence of his spirit, then what gives us any belief that you're headed toward inheriting the kingdom of God? There's, why? There's no reason. That's what he's saying. It's not if you mess up once, you slip on the banana peel and you fall from grace. It means that you're not evidencing that you ever knew God in the first place. That's what, it, that's what it means. That's what he's talking about here when he's talking about gratifying the desires of the flesh. And here, here's why, uh, to go back to the, 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 the sack race idea, here's why it's so dangerous, is because when you gratify the desires of the flesh, you are ultimately selfish. Let's just call it what it is. I, listen, man, I'm there. Remember, I gotta live these messages <laughs> before I teach it to you. But think about it. If you are in that sack race, is there any room for anybody else? There's no room for the spirit. There's no room for loving anybody else. There's no, there, it is solely focused on you doing what you want to do. It's, it's selfish. No room for anybody else. And that's not the way we're to live our Christian lives. So you know you're gratifying the flesh when you don't want the spirit around. When you don't want the spirit around, then you know you're going in an opposite direction that the spirit wants you to go. Remember, he says the works of the flesh are evident or obvious. And because they're evident or obvious, they're usually done in secret. A lot of these things are done in secret. You, you might say, let's, let's just go back and take a, one that looks relatively benign, jealousy. And you'd go, man, nobody would call me a jealous person. Yeah, but do you have jealousy in your own heart? Like, do, do you wish that you had what she had? Do you wish that you, you know, looked like he looked? Is, is that in there? You might not express that to anybody. But it's there. If you're obvi it's obvious to you. It may not be evident to everyone else. But that's, that's fulfilling, gratifying the desires of the flesh. And all it does is separate us from other people. There's no room for anyone else when you're gratifying the desires of the flesh. And a lot, we, we all know that because sin has destroyed our relationships with other people. Someone has sinned against you or... If you're big enough to admit it, you've sinned against somebody else and it's fractured that relationship. There's no, when, when we fulfill or gratify the desires of the flesh, there's no room for anyone else. So, in order to not do that, be around other believers who are walking by the Spirit. Be around other believers who are walking by the Spirit. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you some, some quotes and phrases that I read this week when I was thinking about this idea. You've heard that misery loves company. And guess what? Misery gets miserable company. Because you might go, man, I can live the way I want to and I have plenty of friends who live the same way. Okay, are those spirit-filled believers who are walking by the spirit? That, that's miserable company. I read another quote, you cannot change the people around you, but you can choose the people around you. And that's true. And here, here's the ironic thing, and I'm gonna flip that quote on its head. You can't change the people around you, but they can change you. It, it, it's crazy the way that that works. But the Bible even teaches us that in Proverbs that bad company corrupts good character. <laughs> that the, the people that we're around can change us, even though we can't change them, you can just choose who's around you, but you choose the wrong people and they end up changing you. And some of you just need great, spirit-filled people who are walking with the Holy Spirit to be your community, to be around you, to be speaking into your life, to, to be your social circle, to be certainly your spiritual circle, but just your, in your everyday life. Some of you need that so that you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. And here's why it's so important. Because when you walk by the Spirit and you're surrounded in that biblical community, then you live in a way that brings life to you and to others. 
This is a twist to this passage. You live in a way that brings life to you and to others. You see, we would think that ultimate freedom is I'm not connected to anyone. I'm independent. I can get in the sack race and I can go wherever I want. But actually, freedom comes from being around other people, from the spirit producing good things in you. That's what he talks about in verses 22 and 23. By the fruit of the spirit, but the fruit of the spirit is love. That's agape. If you want to write that down, that's the unconditional love is the word that's used here. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness. Goodness means integrity. That's that's what that word means. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control, and I love the definition for self-control, especially when we talk about over-desiring. Self-control here means choosing the important over the urgent. Choosing what's important over what's urgent. Oftentimes our desires, our needs, our cravings that we capitulate to are urgent. But self-control says, I'm gonna choose what's most important. And it says, against these things, against such things, there is no law. (laughs) There's no limit. We don't have, how many laws do you know that are against joy? Like, you are being too joyful, settle down. You know, showing a little too much peace there. I'm watching you. There's no law against that. You are free, free to enjoy that and free to share that. That's what, as I study this, it was so ironic because all the time up until I I really started digging into this in my Christian life, what I've thought about walking in the spirit is I get to enjoy love peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all all the fruit of the Spirit. But what I realized is, how do I know I'm being patient unless it's tested out on someone? How do I know I'm showing unconditional love unless there's someone I need to unconditionally love? The fruit of the Spirit is to connect us to other people. It's not just for us. And notice that it says fruit of the Spirit. It's not plural, It's because these things are the result of keeping in step with the spirit in the three-legged race. These things, they epitomize your life. I don't think this list, maybe this is heretical, I apologize, Cody's opinion, I don't think this list is exhaustive of all the things that that the spirit brings into your life and brings through your life. I, I think it's a great comprehensive list but I think he does so much more as well. He's just trying to give examples of what that life looks like. So that's why he says the fruit, the result of walking in the spirit is this. It's this kind of life. You you don't get to choose which one of these, and that's the thing, you don't get to say, well, Cody, I'm loving, but I'm just not super patient. Well, then you're not walking in spirit because this is the result, this comprehensive Uh, life is what it looks like when you keep in step with him. So you know you're walking by the spirit when your life is focused on others. When your life is focused on others, you know you're keeping in step and walking in the spirit. Harvard did a study, a 75 year study, they just finished it of 724 participants to find the secret to happiness, and this is their conclusion, and I quote, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. After 75 years, 724 people, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. Harvard, I could have come up with that by myself. But those good relationships that make us happier and healthier come from the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the life isn't just focused on me experiencing joy or peace or patience. It's sharing that with other people. It's connecting us with others. That's what the Spirit is trying to lead us to. But when we don't and we go over here, we're just focused on ourselves and we're not gonna experience love, joy, peace, patience, kind of. Let me give you a real example uh, and I confess this as sin. Uh, I, I sh- anyway, 
day before my son is gonna start school, Dax, and uh, I'm putting him to bed, and I, he, he's laying down, and I've, I just feel this, like, like keeping in step with the Spirit. I feel like the Spirit is trying to drag me, and he's like, pray for your son before his first day of school, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired right now. Like, I don't, I don't wanna pray for him right now. I'm, I'm being honest. I don't want, you're, you're like, I'm leaving this church. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to, man, this is, I'm, I'm so tired, and I, I just felt like he was like, you need, you need to pray. And so I, I felt like he wanted me to ask Dax, our oldest son, ask him what he wants you to pray for. And I was like, no, okay, fine. I'm gonna pray for him, but I'm just gonna pray that he gets a good night's sleep. And so I just put my hand on his head, and I said, God, give Dax a good night's sleep so he has a great first day of school, amen, God bless you. And I went, I walked out, I went to bed, Next day, I got, uh, I got up, and Dax did not sleep well through the night at all. And the next day, I got up, and I'm taking Dax to school, and I was like, you know what, Dax? I, I need to confess to you. I'm sorry. I felt like God wanted me to ask you what I should pray for last night, and I should have done that. So is there anything you want me to, to, to pray for? Because I, di- I didn't do a good job last night. He goes, yeah, you didn't. You just prayed that I would sleep well, and I didn't sleep well at all. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it obviously didn't work. So but what do I need to pray for? And he actually shared a few things with me that I was like, you know, God, I'm sorry. I should have just taken the time, kept in step with your spirit, and prayed for my son. See, he lost on that, and I lost. When we keep in step with the spirit, it, it makes us experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things, as well as others. So, if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna live this spirit-filled life, generously share the fruit of the Spirit with those around you. Ha- Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a fruit tree that eats its own fruit? I haven't. Because fruit trees don't bear fruit to eat the fruit themselves. It bears fruit to share fruit with others. That's the point. And that's what he's saying. This this spiritual life, when you keep in step with him, you will find fulfillment. You will find freedom against which there is no law, against which there is no limit if you keep in step with him. And other people get to experience that life as well. See, freedom and victory over sin that we so often get stuck in is yours as you keep in step with the spirit. We get tripped up and he wants to set us free to live a life against which there is no law, which you benefit from and everybody else. Look at verses 24 and 26. It says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, then let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. He says, keep in step with. That means follow That's why I showed you the video, because the teams that kept in step with one another, that got in that rhythm, man, there was momentum. They were going forward. They were going fast. That's what it is to keep in step with. That's what he's admonishing those believers to do. Keep in step. Keep walking with him. And here's how you know you're keeping in step with the Spirit. It's when you find yourself constantly at the cross. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of all Jesus said and did. And so if you're constantly being led in this three-legged race back to the cross, then you know you're walking by the Spirit because you're living in light of what Jesus has done for you. That, that's, that is the key. And so here's, how you do, here, here's what that means and here's what you should do as you keep in step with the Spirit. Sift all your desires through the cross. Because he said, remember he says back in verse 26 that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if you're living underneath the, underneath the cross, if you're living in light of what Jesus has done for you, then you're sifting all your desires through their good, bad, and ugly. Good desires, you look at the cross and you go, well, God, I mean, you didn't withhold your son, so surely you're not withholding any good thing from me now. Or maybe it's a bad desire, and it's like unforgiveness. And you look at the cross, and you go, oh, you forgave me. 
for everything I've ever done and everything I will do. In light of that, I'll forgive. Or maybe they're ugly desires. You wouldn't even want to speak out loud. Well, you have died to sin. <laughs> you have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. Go back to Galatians 2.20. Go back to Romans 6. Don't you know that, you've been, that you have died with Christ? Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ and present yourself to him as a holy instrument. Present yourself to him. Sift all your desires through the cross. You see, we get in trouble when we walk alone and we try to gratify the desires of our flesh by ourselves. So to constantly enjoy Christ's freedom in your life, never walk alone. Never walk alone. Bound in the spirit. In that three-legged race, always with him walking by him, his presence and his power. And I wanna give you an opportunity to do that as we sift our desires now through the cross. And so we're gonna pray at all of our venues right now. I just wanna give you a second to, to see this, to get this mental picture so that you can enjoy the freedom that Christ has paid for for you. So bow with me. I want you to imagine yourself in that three-legged race, bound to the Spirit. And he's leading you to the cross. Are you reluctant? Are you resisting? Tell him that you yield to his guidance, to his power to his presence, you'll go where he leads you. God, thank you that there's forgiveness at the cross. Thank you that your spirit empowers us to walk toward freedom. Forgive me, forgive us where we've grieved you and made you sad because we've walked away from you and tried to go our own way. Where we're stuck, make us unstuck. Free us from that bondage. And fill us with the fruit of your Holy Spirit that we might reconnect with you and reconnect to others as well. All for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.